I see. Yeah, we should be live now. Okay. My screen big. All right, welcome to my second episode for today. Uh, Full Court Press with Coach Jade, one on one conversations. Today, I got the founder and CEO of the Atlanta Entertainment Basketball League, Mr. Jahi Robbins. We grew up together playing ball in the parks at the Y and everywhere. So, I'm going to let him talk a little bit about himself after asking the first question that I ask everybody. So, Jahi, as a basketball player, what was that first? like whooping against what team, against what player did you realize that you had to work at the game of basketball to be good? Shit, how many of those I got? I, I don't know where to start. I, I'll start locally being that, you know, that's where our connection and, and, and familiarity is. Um, I think the first time that we played Wade Hampton, um, when Wade Hampton had uh, the kid Thompson and the two African kids, um, I said, man, if I if I'm gonna make any mark in, in South Carolina basketball and I gotta play these dudes for the next three or four years, I'm in trouble. Um, right. So you know, I you know, growing up in New York, man, you know, I've been playing basketball since I was three years old. Um, you know, I started like real like regulation referees at about seven to eight, um, and you know. I never really looked at basketball as like a real, like you got to put in the work. You, you know, we just did the normal stuff that you do as a, as a young hooper, your dad or a coach take you out, you work on, you know, the fundamentals. But um, when I, when I came to South Carolina, man, um, I had the natural skill set and the ability already, you know, I, I could pretty much do everything. One thing that separated for me at the time is I could shoot the ball. So a lot of New York guards, you know, everybody was like, hey, but they can't shoot. Um, you know, one of the things I, I worked on tremendously was shooting the ball. So when I ran up against them, man, that was my uh, that was my sophomore year. Um, I, I knew I was like, man, I got to get in the gym more. I got to get in shape. And, you know, I got to start working on other aspects of my game besides just scoring and, 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 and being the floor general. You know, so that I would say that and right up there is probably playing against Union. Um, you know, with, with, with Coach Pitts and, and Corey Pitts and uh, Crank and Rice and all them boys, um, it, it challenged me a lot, man. But, you know, it helped me grow and, and, and be able to become a better, you know, a better high school player and then ultimately a better, you know, uh, college player as well. Talk about your journey from Broome. What, what ultimately brought you to South Carolina? And then talk about your journey from Broome to GPC and then so on from there. Yeah, um, so, you know, New York just was at a crazy time, man. I mean, you know, I was in uh, middle school and, you know, we had people that was getting killed and, you know, we was rioting every day um, in school. You know, I was one of those guys, like, you know, I wasn't a street street guy in a sense. Like, I went out hustling and, you know, I wasn't a terror in the, in the city, but I held, you know, I held some some weight for my neighborhood um, so I became a target because not only was I, you know, a good athlete, um, you know, I was, I was at what we call with the shits, you know what I mean? So, um, my mom was just like, it, it, I got to get you out of here. This is, it's gotta be somewhere better. Um, and crazy story is, you know, I was originally supposed to come to move to Atlanta first. Um, we had went to, uh, we went to Orlando, Florida for, to go to Disney World. And on the way back, we stopped in Atlanta, seeing my family here. And my aunt had just moved from New York to, to Cowpens. Um, so of course we stopped in Cowpens and instantly, man, the, the, I think we were there for like a week. Um, my mom fell in love with it. She was like, this is where I want to live. You know, she like, I don't, I don't see no other place that'd be good for, you know, my family. Um, for what I'm trying to do to change my life. Um, so, shit, maybe six months later, man, I was in South Carolina. Um, you know, and it was it was the best move. Um, I still, you know, my mom's not here with me now, man. But I, hold on one second, man. You good. But um, 
But yeah, man, I, I still tell people to this day when I have conversations, I'm like, that was the best move that has ever happened in my life, in my opinion, because it changed the traje tra trajectory of where my future was going. You know what I mean? So when I came to South Carolina, it was an eye opener. You know, at first I used to go back home every week to New York. Um, but, you know, as I settled in and, you know, I made friends and I got for more familiar with the area, you know, it became my home, you know, so wind up coming to Broome. I think I, I started school a little bit later than everybody else. Cause you know, normally in New York school starts in, um, in September at the Labor Day. So mm -hmm. I came, I came a little bit later um, than the normal students. So school started in August. I think I came, I started school maybe like uh, right at the end of September. So I missed like all the preseason conditioning and, you know, all the stuff that goes on. So when I came, it, they used to call me New York when I first got the broom. They'd be like, New York, New York, New York. So, um, you know, all the guys that pretty much was on the varsity team at the time at Broome had seen me play already, either playing at the park, you know, coming to the wild, playing with y'all, um, you know, different things of that nature. So I already had, like, people kind of knew who I was and kind of knew my game. But, like, when I, when I got to actually try out with the team, they was like, yo, this kid got to play varsity. You know, and the one thing that really affected me, I think, was because we, I don't know if you remember Coach Robinette or not, but great guy, man, really had a great heart. Um, I think, you know, at the time, people looked at him as a, you know, he was really a good coach in South Carolina, especially in the upstate. Right. So you really couldn't, I don't know, I wouldn't use the word challenge him, but you, you, you had the full fit in his mold, kind of like a Bobby Knight type thing, right? Like, I don't care how good you are, you got to come and conform to what Bobby Knight wants you to do. Right. And I, I, I wasn't mature enough yet. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and I, I won't just say I wasn't mature enough, but I think my skill level was way above where the team was at. You know, I'm throwing behind the back passes, shit flying all over the place. Guys like, yo, what is he doing? Because ain't nobody else doing that. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, it, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a shocker because I played JV and varsity. So I played a lot of JV just because that next group that was coming wound up actually being my group that I went to the upper state championship with. So coach Robinette was like, I want you to play both. So I played a good build, good deal of JV, you know, and then I played on the, you know, varsity, you know, eight quarters, whatever they call it. Um, so, you know, that changed kind of like how I felt about Broome and how I felt about South Carolina basketball. It really put a damp on me for about two years um, to the point where I did get angry with the system in the school. You know, and a lot of people don't know that. You know, my 10th grade, yeah, I was going to either transfer to Spartan High or to, uh, to Dorman. Um, you know, so the, the saving grace, I would say, for me and then for Broome as a program was that coaching madness came. So that that off season, I think uh, in the spring of my sophomore year, um, Coach Robinette got fired or he stepped down one of the two and um, Coach Amanda's came. And the first thing that Coach Amanda said to me, him and Coach and the assistant coach, Coach Hamill, had came into me and Fred's PE class. And uh, no, I'm sorry, that, 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 was, that was later. Um, coach, they got us out of class. I remember this, like I remember like it was yesterday, man. The principal, assistant principal was Mr. Hughes, Jade Hughes' dad. Mr. Hughes came and got me and Fred out of class and brought us down to uh, the gym. And he was like, man, I want to introduce you. I want y'all to meet, uh, I want y'all to meet the new basketball coach. So I see this white chubby guy, you know, I'm like, what the hell is he going to do? This is, this is the same thing we just was going through. Like, we need somebody here that know how to hoop. You know what I'm saying? Because you remember back then, man, we didn't have social media. We didn't have all that stuff that you can find out who your coach is and what they did. But, right. you know, we, we, we walked in the gym and, you know, we he was like, man, I want to. And he was still young. Coach Amanda's, uh, Coach Amanda's had just um, just finished playing college basketball, you know. So uh, he had, he walked in the gym. And he's like, man, I want to I want to play y'all. Uh, two on two, you and Fred versus me and Coach Hamill. So they played us. We beat them, of course, but they played us hard. Like they fouled us. I mean, you, 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 
like one of those brutal beatings, man. But after we played, man, he 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 told me something that you know has stuck with me to this day. He said, "You have." He's like, "I've never seen a, a point guard as fast as you, can handle the ball the way that you have, have the IQ that you have." He said, "If you believe in me the way that I believe in you, and you buy in, just buy in. Give me these two years and buy in. You'll leave here and you'll play Division One basketball." And we may possibly, you know, make a make a run uh, for a championship. Again, cocky job from New York, know it all, done seen it all already at just, you know, 16 years old, right? I know, I know everything about basketball. I'm like, right. man, hell with this dude, what he talking about. I see what's going on at Spartan High. I see what's going on at Dorman. I'm like, I need to be where that's at. You know what I mean? So, um, I remember, I, I can't remember where Coach uh, Lau and my mom talked, but I want to say it was either at the school or it was at something we was doing at Sparkbird Methodist. I can't remember, but he was like, man, you know, we would love to have him over, you know, been hearing a lot of great things about him. Uh, I guess he had talked to Coach Robinette. And then when I, I really shifted and was going to go to Dorman because I had I started getting cool with Curtis Nash. So Kurt was like, yo, come over here, man. We ain't got no point guard. They got... They got Nate Harris. They got, you know, he started, you know, it, it was almost like how they do now. Like, how guys are trying to get guys to come. So he was selling me on, you know, the different aspects of Dorman and how the community as a whole, you know, would wrap their arms around me or whatever. But I don't know. It was something in my spirit, bro, that was just like, man, my boy's here. You know what I'm saying? I don't know how difficult it is over there in the sense of school. I kind of got this down packed a little bit because I don't know. Were y'all on block schedule when we was on block schedule? Nah, we, we never yeah, I think, been on block schedule. Yeah, I think I think we was the first school to be on block. I think us to Ball Springs. So I was like, man, if I go from a block schedule back to that class, you know, six, seven, eight periods, I might be in trouble. You know what I'm saying? So I put a lot of consideration into that. Um, and I wind up saying that broom, man, and I and I really feel like, you know, we didn't win the champ state championship, which is, you know, what we was setting out to do. But we 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 did something that changed the game, in my personal opinion. And I know everybody got their different opinions about the basketball scene, but I feel like that 01, that 01 Broom High School team did something different for the upstate in a sense, because man, we was knocking off everybody. You know what I'm saying? We was 20 and 10, bro. We lost three games in Kentucky. So that means we only lost seven games. We lost the Union twice. So that means out of, out of, out of, out of uh, you know, two or three games that we lost in the entire upstate that whole season. Now, there has been teams, you know, after us that only lost one game or two games. But, shit, you ain't thinking about no broom high school when you think about basketball. You know, I mean, way back in Dooley Miller, you know, that's my guy. You know, those, those, the older, the older guys, but you know, in our generation, you know, we didn't know nothing. When it, uh, when it came to basketball for Broome High School, you know, it was probably some times where they had good players, but Broome had never been out of the first round of the playoffs. You know what I'm saying? They had never won a playoff game up until that point. So for me, man, I felt like, you know, yeah, my senior year, we went to the upper state championship. We was number three in the state at the time. Um, I, I just felt like, man, I, I, I did what I came here to accomplish. And that was to change the culture of the high school. You get what I mean? You couldn't tell me my 11th and 12th grade year, bro. And I remember times where, you know, I would see you, Zai, and Titus at the mall or Tony at the mall. Y'all had y'all Spartanburg shit on. We had our broom stuff on because it was like, yo, you, 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 you gotta rep, you gotta rep this now. And 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 think about it. If we would have knew about branding and marketing and all that stuff back then, you know, that that could have been a whole business within itself. You know, like right. what Nate doing right now with creating the t-shirts. It's like, come on, bro. And we would have had the hindsight about how dominant we were and in, in the in the legacies that we were leaving behind, man. So. I don't really have any, you know, uh, negative feelings about like not transferring and not even winning the state championship. I think it is set up the next classes to have something to strive for, you know, to finish what we started. Um, 
so yeah, man, for, for, for me, after leaving South Carolina, um, I'll touch on this a little bit and then, you know, we can go back, I guess, into whatever other question you have. A lot of people don't know, man, I was recruited by everybody in high school. Um, Furman, Gardner Webb, Clemson, Walford, John C. Smith, North Carolina a and uh, obviously all the local schools, Spartanburg Methodist, Newberry, um, but I didn't have the grades, man. You know, I, I still was playing around, you know, shit, I think my GPA and this is no, like, it ain't funny, but it's real and it's, it's what's helped me get to where I'm at today. You know, one point in time in high school, my GPA was like 1.4. You what? know what I'm saying? So, um, I, I still like basketball because, again, when you grow up in New York, ain't nobody talking about no damn school. You know what I mean? They just have you, you, you show up and you raise your hand for attendance. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they ain't, I mean, like, dog, if you a hooper, you a hooper. I ain't talking about nobody that's just on the team. If you one of those guys, you go, they just go to class. Make sure you go to class. That's it. Ain't nobody like A's and B's and then the crazy thing. And it's still like this to this day, which is crazy. In New York, 65 is passing. So I had, and, and bro, I will post this. I keep saying I'm going to do it. So, so these parents understand, man, that like I'm not BSing nobody when I reach out to you to talk about the importance of the education part for your kid, man, I had 66, 67, 69 in English, math, social studies. That's passing in New York, bro. In South Carolina, that those are F's. <laughs> they are F's. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so all of that narrative that, you know, I was used to, I hadn't, I wasn't able to change it yet. It wasn't until, you know, and, and this is why I love this dude to this day, bro. And, 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 you know, I try to tell Titus all the time, man, his father saved my life when it comes to understanding my purpose, my vision, who I am, you know, why, why I am the way that I am and why God put me here. Because do you support me in his office once or twice a week? What's up with them grades? You know what I mean? What, 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 what you doing in this class? Oh, this, you know, to the point where, People wouldn't even talk. No teachers would talk to my parents. They wouldn't talk to Coach Manners. They just talked to Coach Miller. That's it. And he'll put me in his office and he'll tell me what it is. And he like, look, man. And and um, the crazy thing was my senior year, I had took the SAT. I made a 980. If you remember back then, the you had to have a 2.4 and a 980, I think, a 990. So two, three, I made the 980. It was a 2.0 with a 9. 50, something like that. Yeah, right? So then you, you know, you had like, if you had a, uh, a, a 2.2, you know, like, yeah, so I had the 980, I made it, I made a 960 my first try. I got the 980, but I had a one, a 1. 1.9 GPA. So how you going, you can't even graduate with a 1.9. No. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of that, man, you know, I, I tell people all the time is I had people who don't even realize how much they did to get me to this point. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, through that process of recruiting, you know, Coach Amanda's, I don't know if, you know, kind of he understand, like he was a highly recruited guy uh, out of uh, Burns, out of high school, but I don't think he understood what I was dealing with because I he had grades. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have no grades. So where guys are coming to recruit me um, and – as you know, scouts, uh, you know, recruiters, hey, what's his grades like? First thing they ask him, what's the grades like? We know he can hoop. Um, so, you know, that cut maybe me cut all my schools by 50%, just my grades. Um, and I was looking at so the so at Broom when I left, uh, the three schools that 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 I really, really were interested in going to, and I liked the campuses was um North Carolina AT. Uh, Charleston Southern, and I, I really would like, I would have liked to stay at home at Wofford if, if everything would have worked the way that it was supposed to. Um, but I had to go to JUCO. I couldn't, my, my, I had did so bad my freshman and sophomore year, bro. <laughs> it's like, like, bro, you, it, it, it's going to take, yeah, it's going to take a miracle to get you, you know, over that hump. So, uh, went, I, and I think you played with me, if I if I'm not mistaken, when when we played in Junior Nationals, yeah, at at, uh, at Clemson, yeah, 
So, so I played at Junior Nationals, um, and that's where Coach Barney from Georgia Perimeter seen me. Um, and it was history from there, man. Like, I, I fell in love with, with you know, him as, a, as just as a man. Um, um, fell in love with what, what he had built at Georgia Perimeter as a program being one of the powerhouse JUCOs. And I didn't, at the time, I didn't really know a lot about JUCO. You know what I mean? Because, you know, that's not what people say you up for. They say you up to go D1 or D2. You know, so when I got to JUCO, um, you know, as for those who know, you know, Georgia Perimeter is run like a Division One program. You know, it's, it's, I mean, ain't no, there's some great uh, JUCOs that play on the court. But when it comes to, you know, the way the structure the way the, the program is built, um, we operated like we was North Carolina Duke, you know. Um, so, you know, I wound up going to Georgia Perimeter, played there for two years, went to the national championship. Uh, keep talking, keep talking bro. National championship. Huh? I said, keep talking. I'm just muted for a second. Okay. Um, uh, went to the junior, co uh, junior college uh, national championship two years in a row. Uh, finish. We lost in the final four uh, my first year um, and Elite Eight my second year. And then after that, you know, I wound up uh, same situation. Grades still impacted, you know, what 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 my future was going to um, future was going to be. I took. Uh, OK, um, I took I took school a little bit more serious when I was at Georgia Perimeter just because I knew the only way to get to that next, you know, to that next level was to make sure that I graduated because I wasn't a qualified coming out of high school. Um, but that changed my life in itself. I had my daughter while I was in college at Georgia Perimeter, just the environment and atmosphere of Atlanta. Um, you know, it changed, it, it changed the scope of how I view things and how Atlanta as, you know, a, a black city empowers entrepreneurs and, and the whole nine, man. So, um, you know, a lot of people, like I said, a lot of people don't know the full journey that I've been on. They just either see me now or they just remember me from back then. Um, you know, so, yeah, man, that's just that's a, just a little touch of it. You know, we could go into more of it as we go. Yeah, man, I appreciate that because I didn't I knew I didn't know all of it, but that was that's good to know the rest of it, of what you what you did. So after you played the GPC, where did you end up doing? Uh, when I, when I left GPC, same situation, man, I had to graduate. I was, I was missing one class. Um, coach young, uh, he, he, he put me on a test. He said, you know, I want you here. I want you to come back home to Spartanburg. Um, and that was my God, man, between coach young and, and, and coach Evans, uh, coach Evans was at Gardner Webb at the time. Um, you know, those were the two schools that I really kind of narrowed things down to. And I mean, there was a lot of other schools, you know, I had a lot of HBCUs at the time. I didn't understand the HBCU culture and scene. And I'm like coming from Broome, you know, to Atlanta, I'm like, yeah, I might need a little bit more diversity. You know what I mean? Um, but I didn't, I didn't understand HBCUs the way that I do now. Um, but I wound up, I wound up, what, what happened was I didn't finish my science, uh, uh, course that I needed to fulfill my graduation. So Coach Young was like, man, I need you to graduate. If you don't graduate, I can't wait till the summer. I got to know, you know, I got to know who my point guard is going to be going into this year. And I only got one scholarship, four point guard left. Um, so with me not, you know, passing the class, I lost that scholarship. And basically it was like, shit, the last option is, is Coach Evans. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, so Gave Coach Evans a uh, gave Coach e Evans a verbal that I would come with him to Gardner Webb. Uh, about less than three weeks after I committed, uh, he said, "Yo, man, I'm leaving." I'm like, "What?" <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, "How, how did I just committed? How you gonna leave?" You know? Because what people don't know, and a lot of parents, if anybody's tuned in that has athletes, um, a lot of times your kid is committing to that coach, not that school. You know, and a lot of a lot of parents don't understand that um, the kid is building a relationship with the coach. 
the kid doesn't really know a lot about the school unless they, you know, obviously we we talk about Kentucky, Duke, and Syracuse, schools like that. But, you know, more mid-major, low-major schools, kid really doesn't know a lot about the school. They're committing to the coaches that are recruiting them. So when Coach Evans told me that he was, uh, he was leaving and taking the head coaching job, but he didn't know where he was going. You know what I mean? So I'm like, man, this dude been recruiting me, uh, you know, the whole time I was at Georgia Perimeter. Uh, I'm going to roll with him. You know what I mean? But in hindsight, bro, I'm thinking this is a Division One coach. He's been at the Division One level all his life, from playing at Furman, being an All-American, being a head assistant there, then going to Gardner Webb, being a head assistant. I'm like, this dude getting a head coaching job at a D1 school, right? He calls me and tells me, this how God this how God will get you. When you don't, when you don't follow the orders of God, He He will make sure that you every time that it, it comes back around. I skipped the part when I was talking about leaving land, I mean leaving Broome to go to uh George Perimeter. I was supposed to go to Lander University from the jump, because that's what Coach McManus played. They didn't, I, and, and hopefully Atlanta don't get in trouble for this now, but I was going to go to school regardless if I was eligible or not. They was going to get me in school. When I went to that campus and I said, bro, this ain't even as big as my high school. You know what I'm saying? I, I was like, this ain't even as big as my high school. It's no way I'm going to the school, right? <laughs> now the arena, the arena was amazing. Yeah. The people I met, you know, Mr. Benjamin, Coach Horn, everybody was, it was like, everybody was dope. Like, everybody I met, they was like, they knew about me, you know. Um, I was like, I can't do it. It's too small for me. This ain't this ain't what the dream is, man. Like, this this is not what I, I, I put in all this work for, to be on this little campus, playing at this Division One two school. You know, I don't know if they even respect it like that or whatever. So... Speed it back up, Coach Evans decided that he's taking the head coaching job at guess where? Landon University. <laughs> so, 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 dog, I was 38 hot, bro. I'm, I'm not going to lie, man. I was hot. I, 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 I considered, I considered a lot of different options, bro. I, I considered going to um, North Carolina Wesleyan, which was a D3. Don't even offer scholarships. Um, I was considering shit. One one time, I, I think I was like, yo, I'm going to just go and go ABA. Or, or go play for the Harlem Globetrotters. You know what I mean? Like, I, I could not see myself backtracking to Landon University after being on the stage that I was just on. You know what I mean? Like, dude, you're talking about, bro, on any given day at our practices at Georgia Perimeter, seven to ten NBA scouts is in there. 30, 40 Division One coaches, 50 Division Two coaches from all around America, bro. You know what I'm saying? And you got NBA guys that's coming to work out with us. You know, Jeta tell you, like, I be joking with, with, with Jeta all the time, but Jeta was supposed to be at Georgia Perimeter. You can't tell me that, that, that Jeta doesn't go to the NBA from Georgia Perimeter. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So... That was that was a huge it was a huge uh, a, a huge time for me, man, because I, I, I was fighting myself um, just because of, you know, one optics like people like, well, damn, you could have went to Lander from high school. You know what I'm saying? You you did all that to go to George Brim and have a successful career and and, 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 and seasons there to come back to, to Lander. So, you know, that um that that way weighed on me a lot but you know ultimately once I got settled in Atlanta and 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 um and felt things through um those were two great two great years of my life as well man you know um I, I wouldn't change them for nothing besides the fact that I felt like we should have won that championship my senior year right yep let's talk a little bit of Atlanta Entertainment Basketball League Okay. You came from Atlanta. You went from Farmburg to Atlanta to Greenwood. And after Greenwood, did you go back to Atlanta? Yeah. So I, I never, I never, I had an apartment here. Um, like I said, I had my daughter when I was in school at uh, Georgia Perimeter. So I, I always kept an apartment in Atlanta. So instead of like coming home to Spartanburg in the, you know, holidays, off seasons, right. I, I would be back in Atlanta in my apartment. 
So what ultimately made you start the Atlanta Entertainment Basketball League? Um, a couple of things, man. So a lot of people don't know this as well. So I work, I work for the Atlanta Hawks in the basketball development and community basketball uh, department for four and a half years. Um, in between those times, because uh, we didn't operate year round at that time like they do now. Um, you know, we, we did uh, summer, the whole summer, and then there was like programs on, during the fall and programs during the spring. Um, I coach AAU basketball with the with the Nike Georgia Stars program. So I was a I was a player development and recruitment coach uh, for Georgia Stars for two years with Tony and it was yeah so for for three years basically, um, and that was me kind of just wanting to get in, in, uh, make an impact in grassroots and community basketball like I've seen growing up and you know while working at the Hawks. I seen that there was a major disconnect with the Atlanta Hawks in the community. And um, and growing up, I didn't see that. Like the Knicks was always in the community. Um, you know, we, the, 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 obviously people know the Brooklyn Nets now, but the, we didn't have a, a secondary team. So the Knicks kind of was the, the, the organization of franchise that had to take care of the whole New York when it came to basketball. So you will always see the Knicks at community parks or uh, doing camps or letting the kids like I was a I was a president of the Knicks fan club at uh, my fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. So you know there was a lot of inclusion for young African American kids who you know normally can't afford. Believe it or not, parents can't afford it. The programs that they're in typically can't afford it. And if you are getting if you are getting tickets, you sitting up. You might as well watch the game from home. <laughs> you know so, um, so you know, being there for a while and then and like I said, you still there, Ma? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, it, went, it kind of blacked out, but um, but you know, seeing that man, I I was like. I, I got to figure out a way to, to bring back what I grew up seeing and, and, and building something from a community standpoint that could be dope and exciting and also giving back to the community. And believe it or not, man, I started ABL in 2013, but I actually started jotting down the vision for it in like 2010, 2011, while I was at the Atlanta Hawks. So the entire time that I was at the Hawks, you know, when I get frustrated about things, I would just jotting it down or coming up with ideas because I would always try to present different things to the team. Like, yo, we should be doing this. Or maybe we shouldn't charge this much for camps. Maybe we need to go to this side of town to do. Um, we need to go to this side of town to do certain things because these are the kids that don't have that privilege. These kids are trying to service in Gwinnett and Sewanee and all they, they got it. They, they, they parents are season ticket holders. You know, they can go to any game that they want to. They can see these NBA players on a regular basis. Um, and then, man, once I started seeing I wasn't getting any, like, real connection to the organization, I was like, man, I, I, I know I can do this on my own because I've seen it all my life growing up. You know, and I already, you know, for a short stint of time, um, I had, you know, I was doing, like, marketing and stuff and, 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 and uh in college, like throwing parties and, you know, I always used to talk about how to build brands, how looking at the NBA players and, and, and celebrities and p understanding what marketing and branding was. Um, so I was doing that, dibbling and dabbling in that a little bit. And then I really started getting really focused on doing stuff in the music industry. Um, I had two artists that I managed. You, you may or may not know that my cousin Brian was an artist for a while, you know, he was getting ready to get signed to Jeezy. Um, so we was pushing, doing stuff like that. So I'm like, damn, if I bring all this back to what I love and I have a true passion for, which is basketball, it'll all come together. And eight years now, you know, we we won one of the top summer leagues in the country, man. You know, so that, that, was, that was really like the brain and the birth of it. Um, and it's grown into, you know, all those things that I, I really was – trying to focus on and bringing them all together, community, taking care of the youth, 
making sure they have a platform to get exposure, you know, giving back to, to people who want to, that maybe they have the opportunities that we had to kind of learn the game and see it from a business. Cause it's a business, bro. I don't give a shit what nobody tell nobody. At the end of the day, it's a game that we all love. But if you don't know the business side of it, you might as well forget about it. Absolutely. And I don't care if you're the number one player in the country or number 100. If you don't understand that this is a business and you got to operate as such. Have when the ball stopped bouncing, you know, so that that was something that was huge for me with, you know, build the AEBL. So talk about like at any point in time when you were building it, did you get did you get discouraged in the building process? Yeah, man. Um, when we when, when we first launched, it seemed like we we couldn't we couldn't get no allies. You know what I mean? Like the the the, the parks and recs. You know, people don't even know because they see the league so much inside. But originally, this was an outdoor league. I was I was trying to bring the rocket to Atlanta. You know what I mean? So we was we was an outdoor league and you have to deal and work with the, 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 the Atlanta Police Department, city parks and recs. And nobody was trying to give me what I feel like was like partnership. You know what I mean? Everybody was like, yo, pay this fee. This is what the fee is. Do not break these rules. Here's these permits and policies. And I'm like, well, damn, I, you know, I'm looking at this like, I'm trying to give back and, 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 and make these and make the city of Atlanta communities better. You know, you would think that you would be, these people would be like, man, let you know, how can we help? Shit, no, that ain't what they were saying. They were saying, hey, go online, download this, pay this, pay. I'm like, you know, so when when we originally started rolling, you know, that became a hurdle because you're dealing, you're dealing with the city parks and you know, they can say yes or no to permitting. And a lot of times when I wanted to do certain things, they would be like, nah, you can't do that. Oh no, we don't allow this. So we had to, we juggled, man, I, man, if, if I can literally sit down and write a book on just the first year and how difficult it was to get this thing really rolling um, and, and more or less to get people, you gotta think, this is the culture shift for basketball in Atlanta because in Atlanta, they don't play basketball outside. Like I could, I mean, before this COVID, I could go to, I could go to 10 parks and maybe two of the parks got people in there actually playing basketball. You know, so that was a, that was a, that was a, a hurdle because trying to get people to believe that an outdoor league can exist, getting real hoopers at the elite level to come out and play on concrete, you know, that, that, that was, that was a hurdle as well. And then, you know, I would say most importantly, just being someone who had for the longest had been behind the scenes, you know, navigating things. That was a, a big part too, because a lot of people didn't know me yet. You know what I'm saying? So they're like, who the hell is this dude? We not, we not playing in his league or we not su supporting what he doing. So all that did for me, man, you know, if anybody know me, man, I'm a disruptor. I'm, I'm very, very rebellious about the norms. Um, I use that as that I use that as fuel almost to a fault because after the first year we got a little buzz shit the second year bro I went and brought a whole NBA hardwood floor outside you know what I'm saying just right. and, and, and really that was that was really just a flex move to show the city and the people like bro I'm telling you I'm bringing Atlanta I'm bringing the rocket to Atlanta bro that same nostalgia that same power that people understand in the brand that people know about the rucker internationally i'm bringing that to atlanta and when i brought that hardwood floor out people was looking at it like it was a damn spaceship sitting on the on the <laughs> on the court they was like yo how the hell did this dude bring a whole nba hardwood floor outside because again you got to think a lot of people ain't never been to the rucker they only see it on you know, social media, YouTube, or whatever. Um, right. So once I did that, and I think people started taking me serious, that year we had a crazy year because it started raining a lot in Atlanta. Like, it's like Seattle out here now, especially during the summer. You guarantee, it's guaranteed it's going to rain every weekend at some point, you know. So um, 
so yeah, man. So, you know, that year we wound up having half the season outside and half the season inside. And that was the game changer for me because when we went inside, more people came to see the games. The players started playing harder, so the game got more competitive. And I was like, well, damn, Ja, um, maybe you need to go this way. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people were saying, like, yo, you know, this should be crazy if it was inside. And I'd be like, nah, man, I'm trying to, I'm trying to have an outdoor. You know what I mean? And people liked it, but it's just not, it wasn't something that was normal for Atlanta. So, um, so after that year, man, it 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 was it was sky's the limit after that. Like I tell people, man, the the moment is when I realized that, you know, we had the gym that we was in held maybe, maybe 275 people. Bro, we had over 800 people in the gym. I'm talking about the if you I I I'll share a picture uh in the thread uh you know after you share this, man, yeah. you could not you you couldn't it was nowhere it was nothing but the court. There was nowhere to sit, nowhere to stand, and there was still about another 300, 400 people outside trying to get in the game. You know, so at that point, man, I, I knew I knew I knew we was about to be on something on on on, on a big on a big mission, you know. Gotcha, boy, because I know I see it now, and I'm like, man, it make me want to get my competitive juices back from <laughs> I, play it. I just want to play one game, play one game. Right. Okay, that's what me and, right. that's what me and, and uh, D. Wilk talked about, because I remember the first time I met D. Wilk, it was on the court. I had walked into the Atlanta program. They was like, yeah, you playing against Dominique's nephew? And I, I don't care. Right. <laughs> and, we were, and we went back and forth, but it was like, that Atlanta atmosphere, when people are in, when they're in the gym, like they come because not only because people are there, but they come. Right. To see, you know, to see good basketball. Man, what is it like? What joy does it bring to you when, you know, Kyrie walk in the building or Jalen Brown walk in the building and to see the kids' faces when they light up when those guys walking into play? That's what that's what it's all about for me, bro. I, I barely get to see the actual games being played, to be honest with you. I probably catch the fourth quarter of every game, but you know, when those NBA guys are top college kids, our top, you know, they they stars now too, you know, our top our top high school kids, when they walk in the gym and you see them kids jumping around and going crazy and they trying to get their phone out and you know, get autographs and pictures. For me, that's all it's about, man, because at the end of the day, man, I was once that kid that was dreaming that I got to go to a Knicks game and sit courtside or meet Michael Jordan, you know, or, or meet Patrick Ewing. So to be able to give them access to that, man, and, and, and use that as a motivator and inspiration, because now if I can influence them by having something that connects to them and that they love, now they'll listen to me. You get what I'm saying? So when I'm talking to them kids, you know, because I, I, that's pretty much what I do, man. You know, hopefully you can come down this summer if God willing, we able to have a summer. Man, I'm walking around, shaking hands, kissing babies, you know, talking to the youth, telling them, man, like, look, man, use this as your motivation. That could be you out there one day hooping because they, I, I, and this is not me saying this, this is hearing this from, you know, out of the mouths of parents and kids. They, they look at the ABL as the NBA to them. Right. You know, so, so if, if I can go up to a young kid and be like, look, man, you know, mom, because I, I, I promise you, I literally had, and I love it. I, I, I take it for what it is. I have parents that come up to me that bring their kids to ABL and have been bringing them since they was young that will come up to me and be like, man, can you talk to him? Because he ain't listening or he getting in trouble in school or he doing this. And I usually just tell them, like, look, man, Trey Young coming next week, bro. If you're trying to meet Trey Young, you want to get a picture, autograph, you got to get your act together. You get what I'm saying? And Trey Young might not wind up coming until the end of the summer. You get what I'm saying? But now that's sitting in that kid's mind like, man, this dude, going, he's – because you got to – and I hate when parents say your kids should just do what you tell them to do. Yeah, they should, but it's also some reward in there that lets them know, like, hey, I'm doing the right thing. You know what I mean? And – when you do the right thing, you're going to be rewarded. When you do the wrong thing, you're going to get disciplined. You know, like you can't, you can't be all about just discipline and not have the reward. So for me, man, seeing those young kids, man, face and, 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 and their enjoyment is really, you know, what, what makes my heart 
stay committed and passionate about continuing to build this for years to come. With that, who's like who's your most consistent guys? I know the Atlanta guys. Like I know Jalen Brown's there pretty much every summer, but outside of like yep. Dave, Lou, the guys that are from Atlanta, who's your most consistent guys that come? Oh, uh, Mike Scott. Mike Scott. I don't think Mike Scott has missed a summer. I think he missed a part of uh, two years ago when he was trying to get his deal at uh, the Sixers. Um, Shelvin Mack. Um, who else, who else is on the regular? Um, man, so many guys that they are playing. I'm trying to think who's not from him. All our Atlanta guys are there. Lou, Jalen, um, you know, our young boys are getting ready to start coming this year. The, the Colin Sexton's, the Josh Kogis, um, you know, um, who else? Malik Beasley, because all of them are getting ready to be out of their rookie deal. So, so they'll be more available. Um, but I, I would say out of guys that are not from Atlanta, Mike Scott and Shelvin Mack. Gotcha. Who are you trying to get down there? Who's the biggest name you're trying to – outside of LeBron, who are you trying to get there? Yeah, man. I mean, everybody, dog. Uh, uh, Jamal Murray. Uh, I talked to Russ over uh, All-Star. And Russ just like, man, I don't play during the summer, man. That's my time to, <laughs> to chill out. He like, man, I don't even play in the Drew League. But – you know, God willing, like I said, man, hopefully we'll get PG out there. Uh, I know Pat Bev said he he wants to come. Um, John Wall always is trying to come, but for whatever, John been hurt the last, you know, two or three summers. Right. Um, James Harden. Um, obviously, like you said, LeBron, you know, my, 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 the, the, the craziest thing, the person that I really want ain't even hooping no more, and that's Iverson. You know, I, I've been trying to shit. I'm like, yo, dog, you ain't even got to come try to put up no bucket. Just come put on the uniform. <laughs> man, listen, let me tell you, I was coaching in Charlotte, man. It was the West Charlotte game versus North Met. And I'm sitting on the bench, you know, all of a sudden, because my wife, my wife, she was my fiance at the time, my wife is sitting like two rows behind me. And all of a sudden, I see this big ruckus come through, and I was like, and I was like, okay, I know V Mac, Vernon Maxwell, gonna be here because you know his son Tristan played North Mac. And I was like, wait a minute, that's ours. So they got <laughs> off in the corner, and I was like, what's that? Alan I had to ask one of the other assistant coaches, like, was that Alan Iverson? He walked back by, like he got so much attention just because he walked in the gym. It was like it was crazy, right? And then, you right. Know, so that that was like one of my moments. I was like, was that really Alan Iverson that just walked by? Like, it right. Was, it was like, because I mean, it's a high school game in Charlotte. I mean, right. It, obviously, it's a big robbery. It was like the fact that he was there. So I get what you mean, like him coming. To yeah, play. yeah, and it, and just being able to pay homage. That that's really what I what I want to do with it is like when Dominique walk in the gym, people are like, oh, that's Dominique Wilkins, but it's still not like it's not like it would be if it was twenty years ago. Right. You know what I'm saying. Um, so I feel like for us, man, you know, continuing, continuously trying to build a brand that is for Atlanta, you want to bring those people because there's a, there's a group of people that those are still their heroes. You know what I'm saying? So, like I said, not only are we trying to do that for the kids, we are doing that for people like us that they can afford, but just don't have the time. You know what I'm saying? Because you might, you might come and bring your boys out. And this might be the only time you get to really hang with them at a basketball game because you working or you coaching or you traveling. You know what I'm saying? So we try to we I, I try to make sure that I bring balance, um, especially with those people that, you know, I feel like I can necessarily say, yo, Jamal, come to the league. You know what I'm saying? Because right. a lot of times now I'm not asking these dudes to come. They hit me up, hit me up on Instagram or they got my number from, you know, somebody we mutually know. And they like, yo, man, I'm, you know, I want to come hoop in your league, you know? So we don't, you know, people don't understand it, but you know, we don't pay these guys. We don't even put them in hotel. Like we can't, it's, 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 it's under, under the rules and regulations of the NCAA um, in the NBA sanction and that we can't do that. So these guys are coming because they also want to give back to the community. Um, and they, they support what we building with ABL, you know? Yeah, man, I'm definitely going to have to come be a part of it and bring, bring Double and Trouble with me because <laughs> it'll be good for them to 
see that, you know, just on that thing. Cause they don't, I don't think they, they don't quite understand how good I was as a player. So for them right. to, to see it on the other side with just, Hey, I'm with my dad and I'm, I met Trey Young today or Hey, I'm with right. my dad and I met, Paul George today. It, that's you know that's a different that's a different feel than okay. My dad could play, but people aren't gonna know my dad like that. But my dad took me to right. Atlanta, and I got to meet five NBA guys, take pictures with them. See, right. So I I, I get where you're coming from, and I think that's right. Hope that you did that like that. Wish Spumberg could do it that way, but yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a the word I want to use. There's an opportunity there. I, I don't know just yet. Um, I, I think I have an idea of how to approach it. Um, but you know, I'm I'm definitely I'm definitely looking and working on trying to bring not necessarily a summer league, but bring that kind of nostalgia and that 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 vibe of like hooping back to Spartanburg. I, I feel like the city is on fire right now for you know talent um people you got you know you got guys like earl with the sc spiders um you know doing an amazing job trying to give kids bigger and better opportunities and then we had um you know you got you got rj and them over at at, uh at at legacy um you got all the great things that's going on at dorman and spartan high and chapman and, and and broom i mean it's so much going on but if you remember bro we like I, I, you know, I listened to that call um, that you had with uh, with some of the AAU guys, and that's why I posed that conversation or that comment saying, "Well, you know, did you guys even recruit in the upstate?" Because I know for damn sure, I mean, I played everybody in South Carolina, whether it was on the AAU scene or whether it was through high school, textile, whatever. And ain't 2000, 2001. I know everybody got their opinions and you know, who they liked and who was their favorites, dog. But you got, that shit is in the history books, bro. You could, it, it, nobody can deny something that was written in history. If right. you look at that 2001 class, they probably had from top to bottom, from number one to, if you could find all the kids that went to college that year, I don't think there's ever been a better class. And that's why that year was so critical for everybody that was trying to win the championship because you had to go through so many different versions of different teams. You got some team that got three stars, you like Mozzie, Zane, and and, uh, and and Big Boy. I forget his name that, that was at Grizz. So they had three guys, right? Some teams had two, some teams had four. So, you know, you had so many studs that was that was coming out that year. It's no way that somebody didn't have, like, Ron Henderson, but we played more like local textile type of, you know, tournament. There okay. wasn't no AAU team that was like, and it didn't matter if we had a sneaker deal or not. It was more about having that uh, exposure opportunity in the in the infrastructure that, you know, those the South Carolina Ravens had, a beach ball select. Like, well, that's all we needed, bro. Because you could do it between just our shit, between Dorman, Spartan High, and Broom, in 2000, 2001, you put a, a AAU team together, you got the best team in the state, hands down. Because you're going to have 11 guys, 12 guys, and anybody can start. You don't, you're not relying on one person. You know, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to see, you know, guys are starting to get that synergy of like, look, man, you, we got it right here. You know, but why are we letting these kids leave the upstate and go to Atlanta and go to Charlotte? And I'm not, I'm not saying – try to hold the kid or strap him if he don't want to be there don't let him, you know then he don't need to be there but if yeah. you got support which you know this is what i'm saying and, and you know you whoever watching they hearing it now like i'll be damned if i let 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 earl burgess and dd burgess have to struggle to try to to to, to build more of the program and i know i got the resources you know what I'm saying? I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that. Even if it, it don't mean that I gotta oh because I do something with Puma that I gotta get them Puma. No, I even if I just know people to get them in bigger tournaments. You get what I'm saying? A lot of people always think it's about just the money and and it's not. If I can if I can open up a door for them to get them kids into a better tournament that's gonna get them more exposure with coaches at, hey, that's another opportunity. Right. You know, so you know, I definitely, you know, I wanna I wanna bring 
I want to bring some stuff back to the upstate, man, and, 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 and start trying to build those different bridges with guys like yourself and Titus and Jay Free and Nate. And, you know, hopefully over the next, you know, the next couple of, uh, of months, man, you know, we able to build some more and, and start working on trying to make that happen. Well, I got a little idea. I'll share it with you when we when we pop off live because it's something that I, okay. that's like special to me that I want to do. And it's like two ideas. Okay. One thing I know for sure I want to get done. Okay. But man, I appreciate you spending you know hour after day, take some time, talk to me. Uh, man, I think I think that some of the entrepreneurs that might look at this later needed to see that you know it's gonna right. get tough. But you just got to keep pushing and keep building in your believing in your dream because it'll get done. Yeah. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot, man. You know, um, I, I, I tend to always stick to this. Um, and it's a funny cliche saying it's like, you know, your plan B is, 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 is set up for you to make your plan A work. You know what I mean? So it's like you, 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 you have a vision first. You know, I always try to put a little inspirational quotes for people to think about, because, again, I'm not I don't think normal. You know what I mean? I always been a big dreamer. People always been like, oh, bro, you ain't going to do that. Or damn that. How you going to do that? Or that almost make it like it's impossible. And I tell my guys, you know, my inner circle of guys now, man, ain't nothing we can't do. We got access to everything. It's just if you can get up and go do it. You know what I mean? So whether you are an entrepreneur starting your own business, whether you're trying to get into coaching, whether you're trying to aspire to continue a basketball career, you want to train, you want to do T-shirts, whatever it is, man. The re research, put your plan together. Don't necessarily worry about a black a backup plan. You know, when you first creating the plan, because now you're already defeating yourself. That's where all the different hurdles and different things come into play. Make your plan, strategize around, and make sure that it's going to resonate with people, because that's the most important thing. If it don't resonate with people, it's not going to last. You might get hot and it and it might blow up, but it ain't going to last. So make sure that it resonates and with people and, and that it can help people. And then most importantly, just get up and execute shit, man. That's it. If you can get it done, then you can figure out what you can do better, or how you can make it better, or what you can do different. If you never get it done, it's never gonna happen. You know, and that's that's what I live by every day. Man, that's that's good. I appreciate it, man. Well, this has been another episode of Full Court Press with Coach Jay. Here's a successful entrepreneur to show you that it can be done. So if you need to hear this video again. It'll be on my page. It'll be on his page. It'll be on my YouTube page, Full Court Press with Coach Jay. And it'll be on his basket, his uh, league's page, Atlanta Basketball yep. League. So go back and check that video out. I appreciate it again. Yeah, man. Appreciate you, bro. And let's definitely make sure we connect. Gotcha.